Thanks, Sarah, and thank you all for being here. Um, just to give a little brief summary of my background, I'm currently the Chief Data Officer for the City of Boston. I run the city's analytics team. Uh, prior to this, I was actually the Director of Data Science for the Democratic National Committee. I've also done my share of consulting and did a PhD in political science before that. So what that all really means is that I've done a lot of modeling in my time. And as anybody who's done this for more than a week or two knows, that means I've screwed up a lot. Um, I've, I've written a lot of bad code. Fortunately, I've also spent a lot of time figuring out how to fix it and how not to do it again. So hopefully some of the things that I learned along the way can be useful to those of you out there who want to try this in their own work. So what we're going to talk about today is something that I call sustainable machine learning models. And what makes them sustainable is that the outputs of one iteration of a model are used to generate the data that feed the next iteration. So the kinds of models this includes uh, from my own history are things like fundraising models, where we use a model to determine who to ask for money and then use the results of those asks to update the model in the next round. Uh, we also use that right now to do restaurant inspections in Boston, where we have a prediction model which says how likely a particular uh, food establishment is to have some kind of critical violation. And then once we go out and do those inspections, then we use the results of the inspections to update the model in the future. And so I should say about this, you know, this is not a theoretical talk about some new idea I've had. I certainly didn't come up with this myself. This is a purely practical talk based on having done this for several years, all the things I've learned along the way, hopefully they can be of use to you. So what's unique about these models? Well, to put it in context, I think it helps to start with thinking about a traditional machine learning model. You know, this is what you'll see in a lot of textbooks or data science 101 tutorials. You start out by gathering your data together, you prep it, you train a model, you validate that model, and then you create predictions. So for a sustainable model, there's just a couple extra steps. Uh, the most important thing, what makes it sustainable, is that step at the end of deployment, where you put the predictions out in the real world and you use that to do things like targeting advertisements or, or fundraising solicitations or recommending content or driving audits and so forth. And then you feed that back in to the first stage as you iterate through the model. The second difference is that as you, as you see here, sometimes the retraining and revalidation step is different. Uh, you know, a lot of times it will be automated. Um, even when it's not automated, it's generally much more straightforward than when you're doing it the first time. So the layout that I give here simply takes that down a different path to signify that it's a different process than when you're doing it just once. So what's the big deal here? Well, the main thing is really about optimization. That, you know, when you're just making a model once, you can have a very specific goal. You're trying to come up with the best predictions possible to most accurately uh, predict you know, what class something will be or what the value of something will be and so forth. But when we're talking about a sustainable model, the goals are much more complex because you know, sometimes you may actually benefit by not doing the most optimal thing right now. And the reason for that is that you want to learn. So this is something that will be familiar to anybody who's done experimental research before, where there's a lot of work done, um, it's something called the exploration exploitation trade-off. If you've ever uh, looked into things like multi-armed bandits, you know, this is a pretty common challenge to figure out how much of your energy do you want to expend trying to get the most payoff right now, and how much do you want to try things that are new that probably won't give as much of a payoff, but you're going to learn on account of that. And as tempting as it would be, especially somebody like me who did six years in academia to try to come up with some formal solution, often there just isn't one. There isn't a way to quantify the value of learning and the value of you know, getting uh, the most payoff you can now in a way that's going to come up with a nice clean solution. So instead, what it really often requires is a lot more um, human input to, to monitor and adjust as needed to make sure that your model is in fact improving over time the way that these are designed to. And then the other point that's important to note here is that you know, when we're going from doing this once to doing this over and over again, it's not just analysis now, it's software. You know, we're making something where ideally we would automate it, which means we need to start thinking about things like version control and scheduling and monitoring and so forth, and suddenly it's a whole new skill set that beyond just what you know, your typical data analyst turned data scientist would be familiar with. This is something, uh, particularly in this area, I had to learn a lot of things the hard way. Um, trying to put these sort of things into production. 
So the approach that I would recommend for, for starting to get into this kind of modeling is really to start with research design. And I specifically say research design rather than just model design because the point here is that you are doing research when you're collecting your own data from this model. That you can't just simply start by saying, you know, hey, I've got some data to start with and I'm gonna start writing out some code and take it from there and let the model just kind of come together. You know, really you need to think ahead of time about how is the data you get for future iterations going to be produced by what we do now and make sure that you've built into this modeling process some steps to make sure that you are in fact getting the kind of data that is gonna make your model improve over time. So once you've got that down, you have an idea of how you're gonna approach that, then you get into, into your model development and once you're happy with what you have, you productionize it, you know, clean up the code, take out all the things that you tried that didn't work and so forth, and then you deploy it usually on a server uh, or up on AWS, you know, and then you can run that in a, an automated fashion. And then the new results come in. And hopefully that's an automated process as well. I think from my experience, uh, if you have to either manually pull results or even worse, wait for somebody to email them to you, um, that's gonna make it really hard to automate your part of the process because you can't really go through and do your updates and so forth until you wait for somebody else to, to do their piece. And even worse, if you're taking that away from the automated world, you're opening yourself up to uh, changes that you weren't expecting, whether you know, at the lowest level that's just differences in the formatting of your data, but at a higher level you can have things like, for example, um, you know, having values in particular columns that mean the same thing but are labeled differently from month to month. This is something I ran into doing fundraising models where somebody in the back end who was collecting these results started coding things differently and didn't tell me in advance. So the more of this that can be automated, the fewer places there are for things to, to go wrong on the other end. And then finally, the last step here is the validation step, which is obviously critically important as you're developing a model, but it's something you're going to want to keep doing over time. And the reason you want to keep doing it is that to make a model sustainable, that doesn't mean you just automate it and let it go. You have to actually pay attention to it, check, make sure it's doing what you expect, and if it's not, or if you think there's room for improvement, then you follow this dashed line here and go back to the development stage to say, for example, you know, do I want to tweak what features are included in here? Or do I want to change the type of model I'm using because I think we can actually do better another way? And so periodically, that's something you should plan to do is to go back and revise. So when you're thinking about how to design this, I, the most critical thing is having diverse data. And, and what I mean by diverse data is that you're sampling observations that are coming from you know, a range of the possible options for whether it's people to target for fundraising or you know, which ads you're showing to people online and so forth. Uh, you, know, you don't wanna just have a lot of data that tells you the same thing over and over. Because the point of these models is that the data is free, basically. That you're getting data back that allows you to improve the model as a, a, an organic output of the process itself. You're not, for example, going out and say, doing a survey or experimental test that costs you money that you have to invest time and resources into every time you wanna get new information. Here the information is, is free, except the catch is that it's biased. That the process that you use to do the prediction, you know, that determines what data you get, which means you're not getting random data. And so the importance of having diverse data is simply that you can overcome some of these biases if you have enough information, enough diverse information there to adjust and account for those issues as they come up. So there are two main types that you'll run into. One is just a coverage issue. You know, that's the issue of you not knowing about the population, and for the sake of simplicity, I'll just think of this, and I'll be talking about this in terms of targeting, you know, like targeting for fundraising or, or ads or so forth, but really this applies to any sort of sustainable model. Uh, you know, if you're thinking about the, the total population you could target, say, for fundraising, but you're only actually getting information about a very small proportion of that, you know, not only are you going to not know much about those other areas, you're probably not gonna have your model go explore them either because you're not learning anything that would make you change what you're already doing. You know, that if you think that 90% of the country is a, you know, bad target for fundraising, it's very hard to get to a point where you'd say, actually, you know what, let's try them, unless you deliberately try to and gain data that will 
allow you to update your, your beliefs. But the second part of this, and, and this is where bias really comes in, is when the data you have isn't necessarily reliable. And I think a lot of us are familiar with how that works in, say, survey research, where, for example, you know, we, we've seen a lot last year and every other election year about how you know, surveys that don't call cell phones, for example, miss out on a large proportion of the population. But it's not just who they miss, it's that they make assumptions about the people that they've missed based on the people they didn't get, and those assumptions often turn out to be wrong because people who don't have landlines are fundamentally different than people who do. And so what you wanna make sure is that your model, when you're getting data that comes from you know, a large portion of the potential space, that you're getting data that you can actually rely on, and that if you aren't, you're at least doing what you can to make sure you adapt to that as quickly as possible. So to show a couple examples of what this means in practice, one way this can go wrong is a pretty obvious one, that you just simply target too narrowly. So here, you know, I just came up with a real toy example where you, know, you have a good potential targets scattered all around this feature space, and your first iteration of the model is selected a pretty wide chunk on the right side to try to, uh, to try to reach out to. And so then it goes through, and after the first run, it goes, it targets, it gets new information about some additional observations. And what it does is it narrows down within that window. It says, you know, okay, that big oval that we started with, what's the smaller subset of that that we actually want to pay attention to? And then again, it goes and does that for the, th the third time. And what you're left with at the end is a target universe which, you know, within that smallest oval, you actually have a high proportion of, you know, positive targets. The problem is you don't have very many of them. And as you drill down to narrower and narrower universe, what you're getting is this very finite population where you're not learning about the people outside of it at all. And so from that, you're obviously missing a lot of good targets, but you're also constraining yourself to a narrow universe where if you have a large program, you're gonna burn it out. You know, this is something we run into with, again, and go back to fundraising, you know, it's something we dealt with a lot. Um, one of the most actually kind of comical examples of this is, you know, when I, in my last job, we did uh, direct, a lot of direct mail fundraising. We were sending anywhere from a million to five million pieces of mail a month. And before I got there for a particular kind of fundraising called prospecting, these are people who've never donated to you before. Uh, you know, our pre the previous people who had been doing the targeting had noticed that senior citizens were way more likely to respond than everybody else. So they put in a hard cutoff. They said, you know what, we're not gonna bother mailing anybody under age 64. And so they stopped. And the problem with that is obviously you're not going to learn anything that would change your mind if you're not even trying. And so that's a, you know, still a fairly large population in total, but when you're sending several million pieces of mail every month and you've been doing this for several years, you're gonna exhaust that pretty quickly. And so when I came on board, one of the first things we did was relax that. And what we found was actually by that point, we burned out the 64 and up group so much that the 50 to 63 group now suddenly perform better. And we wouldn't have learned that if we didn't try. And so that's the point here. If we start narrowing down too much, we're not going to notice when things change. The other part here is that you could go the other way. You could invest too much in data from all over the map here, and, and particularly when you've got data that isn't coming from representative sampling, sometimes you can get too invested in conclusions that actually don't hold up. So in this example, rather than focusing on one specific target universe, our model has sampled from you know, a few different spaces, and, and we who can see all these gray, unobserved examples, you know, we know that the vast majority of the, the good targets are in the upper right. But because of the, the selection of data that was seen initially, you know, that's, not, that's not what the model knows the first time around. So it picks from a few different places, and that's fine. The problem is, is the model has picked a few different places where the observations we got are outliers. That's not what the others around them look like. And the problem here we see as we go through this is that rather than updating based on the new information that comes in, our model keeps trying those areas. It's stuck on those initial findings and rather than focusing on the places where the new information it's getting says, hey, you wanna be up here in the upper right, instead it's saying, well, you know, I know we saw a few good ones around these other areas on the left or on the bottom, so let's keep trying. There's gotta be more out here. And you know, this is something that I ran into in politics as well where, um, I actually had a, an incident where we had somebody from a state party call up 
headquarters and say, hey, this new model you sent out here for volunteer targeting, um, it's giving us a lot of Republicans. Why? And, and you know, my first thought was, well, I must have just coded something backwards because that makes no sense. But starting to dig into it, what I found was, you know, oh, wait, the problem is, is that the data I was using was biased because I was using data about attempt, you know, recruitment attempts in the past. And the problem was, was that, you know, generally nobody would bother to, re to recruit a Republican unless they had a damn good reason to recruit them for a Democratic campaign, like they donated money or they showed up at an event. And so what that meant is the Republicans we did have were actually more likely than the Democrats to volunteer because we wouldn't have asked them if we didn't already know that. And so what we had to do was to, you know, adjust our model to account for that. And, and in our case, uh, you know, we just chose, you know what, let's screen these people out of our training data because we know they are outliers. In other circumstances, you might decide, you know what, let's keep them in there, but let's collect additional information and make sure that our model is reactive enough to adjust for that uh, pretty quickly and, and get better. So some strategies for keeping data diverse. One is broad-based sampling. That's just simply adding new information through directed research. Uh, you know, for example, contacting people for fundraising or volunteer recruitment or inspecting restaurants and so forth that aren't in your target universe specifically for the sake of adding information. So for example, with the restaurant inspections case, you know, we have our targeted restaurant inspections that drive our uh, unscheduled ones, but we also do annual inspections or depending on the, the type of establishment, more than annual, where we will go everywhere. And so what this does, it allows us to get inspection data even in places we don't think there's a problem. This allows us to make sure that we're actually staying on top. We can also supplement the data from other areas. So for example, in fundraising, we would borrow uh, names from lists shared by other organizations. And what this would do is this would help us to get information about people that otherwise we wouldn't have thought to target. Uh, you do have to account in there for this, the way that the data gets into your system in the first place. So those, you know, we had to flag them as, hey, this is uh, a target that somewhere like, say, Emily's List or, or another organization shared a list with us for so that we don't, we, you know, we know that they're different somehow. We're not quite sure how, but we get at least some information from that. We can also use weights in our optimization to make sure that we actively target to learn. So for example, when we were doing the direct mail prospecting, uh, we would build ensemble models where we would actually uh, specifically target individuals who in any of the different models we were trying showed up as good targets. So we weren't just saying, hey, let's average across these. Uh, we would say, hey, is there any signal we can get here? And the idea was, you know, we weren't looking for what is the highest expectation. We're looking for essentially taking a chance and saying, hey, there's a reason here that we think that this might have potential. We're not certain, but let's contact you know, this group of people because we want to learn more and figure out if there's something here. We can also do rough targeting. In that volunteer recruitment example, you know, when we shared this with the state parties, one of the things we would do is we'd actually round the scores. Because the reason is we have this top 1% of the scores where usually there are people who volunteered for previous campaigns. And so given that, you know, we don't want to encourage people to keep hitting the same list over and over and only get one type of uh, target. Instead, we wanted them to try a wider swath. So we instead just gave one to 10 scores so that people would still get that good list, but they'd also get other people that we had some reason to think that they were worth finding more about. And then finally, I think this is the, the most key point is what I call high churn modeling. Basically making your model be really reactive to, uh, to learning new information so that it's constantly trying out new things. So for example, we had phone quality scores uh, when I worked for the party where we had have a, a prediction for the best phone for every individual. But if, if a campaign tried calling that phone number, found out it was disconnected, we ran that model every single night. So by the next day, we, if we have another phone number for that person, we would have assigned that and that's available for the campaigns to see so that they can try out other alternatives. So just a few other quick recommendations before I wrap up. When we're building features, we wanna make sure that we build in variety and, and dynamic features so that things can change over time, whether that's building in cyclical things, for example, you know, figuring out the difference between people who donate right before an election versus throughout the whole cycle. We also bring in dynamic features from external sources, things like you know, donations to other organizations, things that will change over time 
um, regardless of what our model is doing. Again, just to keep things fresh and circulating through. One of the key things is also making sure you have the individual history there. So for us, it was not only how many times they've donated, but how many times we've asked and what fraction of the times we've asked have they actually responded? Because that's what allows your model to really start updating over time. And then another way that we found useful was putting together component models, whether that's supervised models predicting things like your, your party support or your income, or it's something like, a, you know, just a, a, a um, excuse me, um, you know, coming up with unsupervised learning to group into different clusters. And, you know, as those things change, it might change the prediction of the overall model, again, giving more variety over time. As far as building the model itself, heterogeneity is key. Um, you know, for this app, these kinds of applications, tree models will let you get a lot more complexity than something like naive Bayes or linear regressions. Ensembles really help out too, um, including sometimes things as simple as doing your hyperparameter tuning and then taking a few different um, combinations that came out at the top and trying all of them. Again, just to get more variety because that will have uh, have a good impact on making sure you have diverse data and also just making sure that you are seeing it from as many different angles as possible. Retraining frequently, rotating your data through, again, the goal here is to keep it fresh. And then finally, when you've got the, when you've done the model, you know, keep, take a look at it, test it outside, not only your uh, holdout sample of just random uh, test examples, but also out of context, the most recent batch hold out by time. Um, you know, a few other things are just basically keep an eye on it, stay on top of what you've done and evaluate the quality of what you've done and really know your data as you go. Check it to make sure things make sense, the patterns are, are meaningful. And again, like I said at the beginning, this is gonna require that you keep an eye on your model and you be willing to update it over time because just because it's sustainable doesn't mean it's going to sustain itself without your help. And with that, I will take some questions. Thank you. Yep. So um, two quick questions. Did you ever model burnout? So you said you hit some people too much with direct mail. Did mm -hmm. you try to find the time length of that? And then also, did you ever, um, Brian quickly broke here, so if you can answer that one. Um, yeah, so with burnout, I think with direct mail, you know, we we're only doing that once a month. So what we would do is in the course of making the model, we would incorporate, um, you know, how long has it been since we last mailed them? How much mail have we sent in the past three or six months? Um, you know, how often have they responded in the past six months in, as a proportion of the amount of mail we've sent? Simply to say, hey, if it's not working, let's change it up. I think the bigger case, though, was email, um, in which we also did. Um, it was never really put into practice, uh, as, as anyone who's received email fundraising knows, um, that there's this sort of dogmatic belief that more mail is always better. Um, but it was definitely a concern that we had and, and something we studied quite a bit to see, you know, were there opportunities to, for example, rotate people out when we're not getting performance and where people are more likely to mark us as spam than to donate. donate. You know, that was a signal that we should probably pull them out, let them rest a bit, and maybe if we bring them back in later, that's something that we can do better. Okay, and the other quick question is, what percentage of your, um, like in your email, direct mail or something like that, was sampling compared to the overall? What? Well, so we were doing less, it's hard to categorize it uh, as one or the other, because we, you know, we would never do it as if we were doing a survey and just mail everybody. You know, instead, what we do, did is to try to keep a lot of different sources of variety. So some of that is, you know, I mentioned uh, adding in shared lists. Um, you know, we also might do special supplements where, for example, you know, we take, uh, I'd say, brand new registrants, you know, and people we know nothing about. But for the most part, you know, what we were instead trying to do is to keep going with our, our, our targeted program, but target in such a way that, you know, we're not just targeting the same people over and over, and we're trying a lot of different people over time. And every time we get another signal, 
you know, whether it's um, somebody making a donation to another campaign or, you know, signing up for our email list or, or something like that, you know, if we get a reason to say, hey, this person looks better all of a sudden, we want to bring them in. And so build, we built our models in such, the way, such a way that, you know, we were continually trying to bring new people into that target universe. Yeah, a uh, quick question. Um, so it looks like you collected a lot of exciting data sets and for people who are looking for more exciting data sets for teaching, for example, is some of the stuff somewhere available to us or that we can use as an exciting case study of yeah, showing so, some of the... Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, the, the only thing that's publicly available would be the stuff I'm doing now. So we actually have an open data website uh, called Analyze Boston. It's at data.boston.gov. So for example, you can actually see the results of restaurant inspections on there. And you could make your model, you could make a model of your own to test this out. Um, Chicago, for example, their model for restaurant inspections is entirely open source. Mm. Um, for us, we've not open sourced it simply because we have data that's being fed into there, which is not open data. Um, but you could still make a pretty good model just based on the open data alone. And so that would be a good place to, to try something out. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that's all we have time for. So thank you again, and uh, hope you found that useful. <laughs>